So, so we'll fall out. We'll start out here where we left off at the last lecture. And let's talk about uh, the area, the posterior aspect of the greater tuberosity. And this is an area where we see a lot of disease. You can have Hillsex impaction fractures at this location. This is where the infraspinatus tendon inserts. And you can get erosions at the insertion of the infraspinatus tendon. This is also where you get the impaction that we talked about in posterior. Dr. Cruz? Yes. Uh, sorry to interrupt. Is your, um, I, I can't see the actual lecture. Um, is that better? Sean can. Oh, yeah. No, now I, I can. Yeah. Okay. It's, I guess it's better if I turn it on, right? <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So starting all over again, posterior greater tuberosity injuries. This is where you get Hill-Sax injuries. This is where the infraspinatus tendon inserts, so you can get erosion at the infraspinatus insertion. And this is where you get posterior impingement. <clears throat> so this is, we've already been seeing a lot of these typical V-shaped appearance of the Hillsax impaction injury. This is on 3-20-2003. And then over time, you can see that some, the bone injury, the acute part, and edema can resolve, and you can just be left with a little indentation here. This is typical of, a, of an old Hillsax impaction injury. And now here we can see this patient has chronic instability. We can see some irregularity of the posterior aspect of the greater tuberosity. The anterior labrum, however, is perfectly normal in this particular patient. Uh, superiorly, inferiorly, we can see that it's actually been sheared off, probably resorbed. Uh, even though the articular cartilage is smooth, we're really missing the, uh, the anterior inferior labrum. And here we can see there's probably an old bank card injury with resolution of the with resorption. Now, here's an infraspinatus. Here's a Major League Baseball player with shoulder pain. He happens to be a shortstop. Now we can see an, a lesion in the same area of the humeral head, but it has a different character to the prior injuries that we saw. They were more V-shaped, kind of smooth in the chronic stage. Here, this is much more irregular. Uh, and on the uh, fluid-sensitive images, we can see a very irregular character to this particular lesion. And notice here's the infraspinatus tendon coming around, and that's really where it inserts. And this is what it looks like on the sagittal images. Uh, much more irregular. Uh, this has more the appearance of a bony erosion. Whoops. Uh, and, and, and the shortstop. No. Now, these, these lesions, to my knowledge, were first described by the orthopedic surgeon who was taking care of the Cincinnati Reds back in the 1940s and attributed these to traction injuries of the infraspinatus insertion on the humeral head, and I think that's what it is. You can certainly see them in baseball players, but we can also see them in most people over the age of 40. This, so this is a very common lesion. It's probably asymptomatic most of the time. The biggest thing is that you can, you can misdiagnose this as either a hill sax or a posterior impingement, you know, obviously, depending upon the history of the patient, if you're not careful. Uh, this is seen probably in the majority of MRs that we see on a daily basis. And originally, we were concerned about these because what we were mainly concerned about back in the 1980s was hill sax lesions. And so we, we thought, oh, my God, there are all these people who are unstable and have these hill sax lesions that we never knew about before until we got to where we understood this a little bit better. And uh, that's when, in researching this back in about 1987, is when I stumbled over the, some of the papers from the early baseball literature uh, for this particular lesion. So this is very common, uh, and these are the two most common causes of abnormalities here. John, did you have something to say? Yeah. Um, people knew about these lesions, uh, well, hill sacs type of lesions in the 1800s. The, the hill sacs, that's when you have anterior dislocation and the hill sacs impaction. That guy goes back to Hippocrates. You know how they used to treat shoulder, recurrent shoulder dislocation? Using a hot poker or a type of an instrument. And, but they used to do it on top of the shoulder, not, not where the problem was. So Hippocrates said that that's the wrong way to do it. He advised to use that axillary approach, but to be very careful about not damaging the vessels and nerve. So you must have known the anatomy. So, yeah, so the, the Hillsax lesion 
uh, kind of in more modern times, you know, it was kind of first described in the modern literature in the 1860s, I believe. We, I had that slide earlier. And Hill, Sa Hill and Sachs were in the 1940s. So that's, uh, and then here's just these erosions can become very large. And clearly this looks really more like a sharply defined cyst. As you might expect, if you have a chronic lesion that's carved out the trabecular bone and you're left either with, you can either be left with fibrous tissue or fluid, just down in a typical geode. Uh, again, uh, this has a, more of a characteristic of an erosion. Uh, and then you can see it there, subchondral cyst. And again, this is the same location where you get the impaction injury uh, with posterior impingement as well. It's in the same location when you have the uh, extreme uh, abduction, external rotation, and impaction of the posterior superior part of the greater, greater tuberosity against the posterior superior part of the glenoid that you've already talked about. So just remember that, that that's kind of the differential for that. The vast majority that you're going to see, and you're going to see it all the time, are just traction erosions there. And I usually describe them in the body report, but I don't put them in the impression unless I think it's a hill sacs or a posterior impingement. And obviously, posterior impingement is only in the high-level overhead athletes. So that really limits it to that patient population. Any questions? What's more common, um, posterior dislocations or sternoclavicular dislocation? Sternoclavicular? Sternoclavicular. Yeah. I guess I actually should have gone through all the different dislocations, but I didn't. <laughs> Maybe I'll add that to my lecture next time. And there are some that are very uncommon and, and rare. But. Another, another question. Uh, uh, Sheila, how are yes. you? How are Good, you? Good, how are you? Good. I feel alone over here. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. Uh, what's the mechanism of injury to anterior dislocation? For an anterior dislocation, I think that they can be, I mean, it could be a direct um, blow. No, that's so, rare. Very, very um, rare. And that um, usually causes a posterior dislocation. Um, could also be a fall. Yes, but what, what, um, where's the arm? Um, think or of that. Can it just be in young people when they just um, spontaneously? Young, old, doesn't make any difference. Um. Think of a, of the Aber view, abduction, extension, oh, okay. and oh, external no. rotation. Hmm. Um, I'm not sure. Yeah. Extension, abduction, and external rotation. Um. So, so fall on the ex for, so a fall fall on the a fall really on the extended uh, arm like oh, in that, in that uh, position right that's uh, on the extended arm yes okay okay so uh, let's now go in let's talk uh, let's continue with the discussion of labral tears now let's go to the posterior labrum and uh, these can be caused by a host of uh, things back there you can get posterior dislocations. You can have a tear from a number of processes that we'll talk about. Uh, you can also get a posterior labral periosteal sleeve avulsion, which is very closely attuned to a Bennett lesion. And then there's another more subtle lesion called the Chem lesion that, that we'll talk about. So this is a patient who fell, a nice uh, uh, <laughs> little history there, trying to save a Picasso from dropping in Malaysia. And there we can see the, the x-ray. Let's see. Uh, Sean, what do you think of this case? A single view. Um, it looks like it is. Uh, there's um, overlapping of the um, humeral joint. So you're wondering, especially since we're talking about those locations, that there would be a posterior dislocation. Yeah, that's very good. As you probably know, historically, this is a, an extremely common cause of malpractice suits is missing posterior dislocations. And on the AP view, especially if it's angled properly, which this is close, but not perfect, but still, uh, you should not have overlapping of the humeral head with the glenoid. 
that suggests that the patient may have a posterior dislocation. And you can also see that this is very much internally rotated there with a little groove here. Uh, and then if we go to the Y view, which is the reason why we really like to do multiple views in the shoulder, you can see the, uh, the dislocation there. And uh, uh, anybody see the dislocation here? Or I guess this is Sean's case. Sean, what do you think of the MR scan? Um, <clears throat> well, again, you have the posterior dislocation of the humeral head, which is impacted yeah. on the um, posterior labrum and an impaction fracture on the humeral head. So it's nice for this person to volunteer to get scanned in the scanner while they were in a located <laughs> position. But it really shows how this occurs. So this is kind of a reverse hill sacs. You can see the impaction of the lesser tuberosity. And this is, we know it's acute because we're actually seeing it, but we can also see the bone marrow edema, just like we talked about with hill sacs. This is obviously much less common than hill sacs. One of the most common causes of this, as you know, is uh, uh, if you have a, uh, Seizures, thank you. Seizures, but but also uh, you can get occasional direct blows, which can can force it posteriorly as well. And then, just like we see with Bankart lesion, notice that when this occurs, there's a lot of force trying to pull the the humeral head back in position again, and the labrum can get sheared off here, as we're seeing in this particular case. Here's the labrum sheared off from the from the posterior glenoid. And then this is just the coronal and the uh, another axial images of that. Now, here is a nine-year-old male f who has recurrent posterior dislocation. Uh, uh, Yuri, what do you think of this case? OK, um, so the, uh, the there's, this is last one was from Malaysia. This one's from Colorado. OK, uh, so we got an axial, uh, I think this axial CT. Um, demonstrates uh, the humeral head uh, posteriorly position uh, in relationship to the uh, glenoid uh, fossa um, consistent with a posterior dislocation. Now look at the glenoid here and what do you see in the glenoid that might be a, might be a predisposing factor to posterior instability? Uh, there is laxity um, uh, there is a laxity of the capsule of of the uh, of the uh, yeah of the of the capsule looks pretty laxed um, okay. as well yeah. as okay. But but what we're seeing here is re abnormal retroversion yeah. of the glenoid, like we talked okay. about in the last couple of lectures. Uh, if the if the posterior part of the glenoid is not well developed, or if it's just angled too much posteriorly then you, you have increased risk for posterior instability, as we talked about in the previous lectures. And that's the case here. Here's the MR scan of this individual. Uh, kind of a nice and anatomic view here with the humeral head here posterior to the, to the uh, glenoid. And you can see, again, where you could get an impaction injury. And again, notice why the uh, posterior labrum is generally torn in these cases because it gets sheared off just like uh, we talked about with anterior dislocation. And here's just other examples of uh, uh, posterior dislocations, impaction injuries, in this case, uh, edema within the bones. And here it is after it's been uh, put back in place uh, where you can see the impaction injuries uh, and probably a tear here that with the labrum back in place kind of obscuring the tear. And a lot of people call these reverse hill sacs. So just for what you what you would expect, here is a 22-year-old male athlete, 16 days after an injury. You can see the reverse hill sacs injury with the edema pattern and the lesser tuberosity and the posterior labral tear. Uh, so when you see that combination, then you've got to suspect uh, a posterior dislocation. And here we can see stretching of the anterior capsule along the lines of what Yuri was talking about in the, the pediatric case. OK, uh, Aram, oh, let's see, Aram doesn't have a speaker. Uh, Susie, what do you think of this case, normal or abnormal? OK, this is one of the more abnormal ones that we've seen. Oh my god. So. Um, there is a V-shaped divot in the um, humeral head. And when you look at the glenoid, 
the glenoid, it, it, I think it's underdeveloped, or at least on that one, it kind of looks underdeveloped. One oh, one cut. Okay. And then there's a lot of um, soft tissue density between the glenoid and the humeral head. So I'm not sure if that's, you know, a ligament that has been torn into there or if it's just like a lot of... The yeah, because... Severe to choose study attribute muscles. Yep. Person very very chunky yeah. Ouch! Oh my word! So there's a. It almost looks like there's a fracture through that posterior dislocated humeral head, fractured line. Sweet. This patient probably is also very osteoporotic, so making the bones more susceptible. How would you treat it? I'd send him to an orthopedist. Yuri? Yuri. Uh, yeah, yes, sir. Uh, that particular case or just posterior dislocations in no, general? We'll talk about the posteriors later, but how would you treat this one? Uh, I'd send them to the... Uh, send them to the ER, but I mean, I wouldn't try to reduce it. Uh, I don't think. I don't think. Um, I, I think it has to be an open reduction, uh, internal fixation of the fracture. Uh, I think it would luck. have to be an open case. Good luck. There, are, there are no muscles to function, and the head is osteoporotic. Uh -huh. The shaft is osteoporotic. The only treatment for this would be to put in a prosthesis. Or mm -hmm. remove all the bones and let it hang. Would there be enough uh, bone stock for for a prosthesis uh, if she's osteoporotic? I, well, then the only thing you have left is a hanging shoulder, which is an excision of all the bones. Or leave it as mm -hmm. is and uh, go from there. Fusion okay. will not work in this case. Okay. Okay, Michael, what do you think of this case? Two axial views of the shoulder. Okay, I see the posterior labrum is torn, and I think there's actually a piece of periosteum uh, still attached to it. Uh, and looking at the lesser tuberosity, I think there's uh, some edema there, so maybe a reverse vein cart and um, a reverse hill sax and a reverse vein cart. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but but that's not the question. We can all see that. How did this person get the posterior labral tear? Susie, you got to be quiet. Posterior labral tear. Um, oh, oh. The muscle development. Oh, okay. So he's got very good muscle development. And uh, typically you can divide. There are all kinds of systems for determining tears and their location and so forth. And I won't go through those because... Many people don't seem to agree. The bottom line is you just have to describe it and give an appearance as to where it's located. But if you divide the glenoid into six different regions, then if you have a tear that involves two contiguous regions, it's called a, it's typically called a massive tear. And these kind of tears and weightlifters are almost always involved the entire posterior labrum extending up into the posterior superior labrum, so they're generally massive tears. And if you look, there have been some recent studies that have looked at this. These typically occur most commonly in weightlifters. And, and, and among athletes, they're power athletes. And the reason really is mostly in the bench press. Because uh, as you'll hear from Karen when we go through the physical therapy part in the lectures with Curl and Job, uh, it's important to tell weightlifters never to have the elbows when you do a bench press go below the level of the shoulders. But they very commonly, if you go to the gym and watch people who are not properly trained, they'll bounce the bell, barrel uh, back uh, down with their elbows getting close to the ground and then push up. And that way, by getting that bounce, they can actually lift a little bit heavier weights. But the bounce is bouncing basically the humeral head off the posterior labrum. And if you do that hundreds of times with uh, very heavy weights, it leads to this condition, which is a tear posteriorly. We see this fairly commonly in Major League Baseball pitchers. The reason is, what muscle do you need to develop in order to have a good fastball? 
the pectoralis major and the latissimus dorsi. Those are the two that correlate with the speed of your fastball. So if you're a major league baseball pitcher, you want to build up the pectoralis major muscle as well as the latissimus dorsi. And therefore, bench pressing is a big part of their training schedule. So they'll often get posterior labral tears. One of the things we'll see in a minute, the form fruits to this may be injured to the posterior capsule or the uh, menisco, uh, the, the labral periosteal attachment, which can then calcify, it's called a Bennett lesion. And on plane films, you always look in overhead athletes for a Bennett lesion, which is just a telltale sign of this process occurring. But here we can see the reverse uh, hill sacs and the posterior labral tear. And there's probably an anterior labral tear here as well. But Okay. Uh, no. Uh, How many types of anterior dislocations are there? Anybody? Three? Well, basically there are four. What, what would you think they are? Um, anterior, posterior, inferior. No, I, I said how many anterior types oh, are there? Many, oh, how many anterior? Oh, is there four? Subcoracoid? Sub? Glenoid? Subclavicular and intrathoracic. The first two are the most common, obviously, 99%. Actually, I know someone who has an intrathoracic dislocation that's chronic. Very, very rare. Maybe I'll get her on the scanner and we can scan her. She, she'd be yes, willing to do not. that. Yeah, I, I know someone who does that. Yeah. She has a deformity there, and she's yeah. Okay, well let's 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 go on here. So let's see, uh, Sean, why don't you take this case? <clears throat> An axial and a coronal image, and it looks like there is some increased edema in the, the deltoid muscle and probably the subscap or the infraspinatus muscle, which you can see. Um, and so I'm um, so you're worried about obviously trauma and strains. Um, and I guess, you know, I mean, I'd also worry about it in neurogenic. Um, there's two little right areas in the inferior glenoid. So um, these are probably suture anchors. So the patient probably suture anchors, had right. uh, anterior labral replacement. So that means it probably had an anterior, dis uh, well, I, he has a history of a posterior dislocation. So anyway, mm -hmm. uh, so what do you think is going on with the muscles? You said neuro. How, what's going on here? Yeah, well, I was wondering if he had a, yeah, um, obviously a, an injury to the nerves or a ganglion that's impressing upon the nerves. Yeah. Um, although and, I don't think the tip, the... go ahead. Yeah, one thing can happen with traumatic dislocations is you can get stretching of the nerves, which can lead to neuropraxis. And therefore you get denervation, which is what we're seeing here, is the edema within the muscle due to acute denervation from stretching of the nerves. Yeah, yeah, in this case, the axillary nerve, because it's in the distribution of the axillary nerve. And then here's just another posterior labral tear. I've seen plenty of these again. And uh, you can get tears of the posterior capsular attachment. And then this is just, uh, this is, let me just, uh, now, you can get, this isn't quite apopsal, but it's close. You can also get, just like an anteriorly, you can get displacement of the posterior labrum along here, and it can scar down just like in the uh, anterior uh, dislocations that were sleeve avulsions that we saw before, in which case you'd have to free it up if you're going to repair it. This isn't quite that, that displaced. Uh, here are just some, some images from Dr. Su in South Korea. And then... Uh, Yeah, and then here, when you get more of a chronic lesion, uh, this looks a little bit like the perthes that we saw before, the chronic perthes after a thickening of the uh, periosteum. But just anything you can see anteriorly, you can see posteriorly. And we went through the gamut of different appearances of the uh, displaced anterior labral tears. You can see the same thing posteriorly here. So this is just a chronic 
posterior displacement, probably chronic repetitive stretching of the periosteal attachment, which is now thickened here. And then again, this commonly calcifies. And on plain films, you can see a little hunk of calcium back here. When you see that, it's called a Bennett lesion. Uh, uh, if it's without the calcium and you just see the soft tissue thickening on an MR scan, a lot of people call these chronic posterior periosteal sleeve avulsions when the periosteum is still intact. Here's just the, the calcification you can see adjacent to the bone in a typical Bennett lesion. And these are well known because in the pre-MR days, uh, this was the only finding you can see in these, and it lets you know that there's been a chronic tra traumatic injury to the posterior labrum. And here's what it looks like. This is the same individual. Here we can see the thickening here, the periosteum here. Uh, uh, and uh, this is all due to a chronic posterior displaced tear, which is then you've got healing and granulation tissue, and this is calcium right in this location. Obviously, we, we don't really see the calcium. We can't differentiate that from fibrous uh, displacement or fibrous placement on an MR examination, at least using standard techniques. But this was a uh, proven Bennett lesion here that went on to surgery and repair. Dr. Cruz, on the um, um, plain films, is that the only projection that you can really see the little calcification? Is it hidden on the other ones? Yeah, it's typically hidden on the You need one where you get the posterior glenoid in profile in order to be able to see it. Otherwise, it's very easy to miss. So you, you basically have to look for it. You can often see it on the axillary views, another reason to get the axillary views. The AP views, you're not going to see it. Thank you. Okay, and here's... Here's another one. I, I never got the plain films, but a reliable orthopedic surgeon described the, the Bennett lesion on the plain films. And here, this is again just a chronically displaced posterior labral tear with thickening of the periosteal attachment. So, what I prefer to do is not use the person's names in the report. I prefer to, to describe the lesion in the report. So, I would say this is a displaced massive posterior labral tear with uh, thickening of the uh, periosteal, labral periosteal attachment. Okay, Yuri, what do you think of this case? Okay, 27-year-old uh, male, right shoulder pain for three years, a baseball player. Um, so we got multiple uh, axial images and uh, two um, x-rays. Um, on the uh, Aber view... Um, yeah, well, this this is the axillary view there. Let me go back. Axillary. Yeah, I don't um, think we have an Aber view here. Um, yeah. Um, so there's abnormal signal intensity and heterogeneity in the uh, posterior labrum. Um, and on the uh, axillary view, there's abnormal uh, uh, calcification seen in the region of the posterior glenoid. Um, this could represent a fracture fragment, yeah, a vault fracture fragment of the posterior glenoid. Uh, um, okay, so so we can see it here. Uh, I I think. These are not usually in this location fracture fragments. You really don't typically get an avulsion of the bone here. I think this is uh, dystrophic calcification in that thick and periosteal attachment of the of the uh, of the posterior glenoid. So I think this is another Bennett type lesion here. Okay. Uh, I, you, you just don't have that firm an attachment of the soft tissues to really pull off bone when you get a posterior dislocation. The injury really is uh, of the uh, soft tissues. And even when you get a anterior dislocation, when you get the, the bony fracture, it's not really an avulsion fracture. It's an impaction of the, of the humeral head uh, on the anterior inferior glenoid. So it's really not an avulsion injury, I don't think, there. It's more of an impaction injury with the head going anteriorly. Okay. Oh, you know, they call it a tractural avulsion. This is from Dr. Sue. But I, it's really more extra-articular dystrophic calcification in the chronically injured soft tissues there. Okay, okay. Sheila, what do you think of this case? Okay. 
So, okay, I do see, it looks like the inferior portion of the labrum does not look normal. Um, it looks like it's irregular and like a piece of it is missing. Um, so it could have been post-traumatic. Um, Okay. Here are the okay. axials. On the axials, it looks like, again, there's kind of abnormal signal, high signal within the posterior labrum. And then I see maybe a portion of the labrum extending posteriorly. And Good. It Actually, just looks like maybe... This is a very subtle lesion, and it's called a chem lesion. This is due to chronic repetitive trauma. Probably, again, this is probably a weightlifter. This is probably seen in weightlifters where instead of actually tearing off the, this may be a precursor to a tear of the posterior labrum, but when you still don't have a displaced tear, what you do is you, you tear the deep structures, the superficial structures are still intact. So if you go with a probe at arthroscopy, the, the posterior inferior glenoid is very uh, soft and it leads to instability posteriorly and a lot of these are probably due to some injury of the underlying bone, but mostly to the underlying soft tissues, but the surface is still intact. And this is called a Kim's lesion or a Kim lesion. Uh, it's just the, that was the name of the person who first described these. And uh, if you detect this, uh, they, they will go in and repair these arthroscopically. What's the most common name you find in Korea? <laughs> Half the population's name is Kim. Wouldn't you want to have that on your portfolio? Kimchi. Kimchi. Kim's chi. Yeah, yeah. And this just shows this. Yeah, this is a follow up in this patient, and it actually got worse over time when we followed it to 914. I think this patient has I think this. I think this is a athlete. And it was a big weightlifter, and I think this was due to repetitive trauma from the from the weights in this particular case. Yeah, but, but I think it's trauma. And so, uh, oops, okay. So anyway, so this is five thirty two thousand and eight, uh, and then this was uh, three years later, and we can see that it's much more much worse and disrupted over over time. I think he was an athlete who just continued to, to abuse the shoulder in this case. <laughs> okay. All right. So uh, let's see. Uh, Michael, what do you think of this case? Okay. We have a single axial view here, and um, I see metallic artifact or artifact susceptibility within glenoid. So there's been a history of a surgery, suture anchor probably, and the history is labral pair. So posterior of the labrum, uh, there's that focus of signal in the posterior aspect of the labrum. The labrum back there looks looks kind of thick on these views as well on this image. Um, so this could be just a recurrent tear of the um, surgical construct there in the labrum, a re-tear. This was a patient, if you look at this, Notice that the patient has poor development of the posterior glenoid. The patient has a retroverted glenoid. And this is a large posterior labrum. Remember? It's important when you see that to put that in your report. Because like we saw before, these, paper, patient, these individuals are very high risk for posterior labral tears. This happened to be another athlete, and you can see as a weightlifter. He had repair of this posterior labral tear, but... You've got to know this patient is at very high risk for posterior instability because of the retroverted glenoid. Uh, and this large labrum isn't going to be very protective against somebody who's lifting 300 pounds. And then what happened here is this is a recurrent tear in the area of the suture anchor. That's exactly right. Okay, let's catch her. Let's catch her. 
so he's got a repetitive trauma going on. I, I didn't I didn't read my own history here. I was looking, uh, but he, you know, pitcher who obviously if he's a major league pitcher. He's going to be a weightlifter, and uh, and here we can just see the injury here to the labor of Mrs. the suture anchor, as you pointed out. We can see a lot of irregularity to the posterior superior cuff, which we know is a common lesion in uh, in these individuals. And here we can see the the this is an impaction injury chronic from posterior impingement. It looks just like a hill sacs, but in this individual, this was not he did not have anterior dislocation instability. He has a glenoid. We obviously, he obviously has posterior instability, not anterior instability. And this was uh, impaction from chronic pitching from posterior impingement. So that was a, that was a retail. Is the retroversion due to the chronic impaction that's no. congenital? The retroversion is congenital. Okay. And here's just a more extreme case of the congenital. In this case, you've got a posterior labral tear, markedly retroverted glenoid, and a large uh, articular cartilage lesion as well. This person is also, you can see, is very well muscle development. Uh, but I don't think he was a major league pitcher. I think this was just a weightlifter. I don't think I've ever seen a pitcher with uh, muscles like a weightlifter. Because weightlifters are very, very uh, mesomorphic and they, they can't move worth a darn. Pitchers have to really. He loops. Yeah, uh, not not bodybuilder type, no. but but weightlifter to strengthening type, which is what you need uh, in the training program to to develop the latissimus and the and the uh, pectoralis. Okay, Susie, what do you think of this case? Okay, um, again, I think there's a. Um, dysmorphic glenoid here. It looks very shallow, maybe a little bit retroverted, and there's a huge tear of the um, posterior labrum. This is an arthrogram, so I think that's why we have all that increased um, fluid. Then there's that V-shaped um, abnormality in the posterior humeral head. And yeah, I'm looking up there too, and I'm first I thought it was, um, I was looking at the ligament, but I'm having a little bit of difficulty going between the ligament and the anterior labrum there. So maybe that's an anterior labral tear. This patient has had chronic recurrent anterior and posterior dislocations. So he had multidirectional instability. And this is a hill sac, so it's in a very unusual position. It's lower than normal. And that's because he had glenoid dysplasia, and his displacements weren't typical of those with normal anatomy. OK, why don't we go on to talk a little bit about inferior labral tears. Again, the cause of these can be many. Uh, what we're going to look at are inferior dislocations, Hegel, reverse Hegel, gaggle, and, and GLAD type lesions in, in this area. So, uh, uh, Sean, uh, does this look like a normal case? No, I think it's another abnormal case. <laughs> yeah, okay. And it, <laughs> it looks like there's an inferior dislocation, as it says, and the humeral head it then is impacted on this inferior portion of the glenoid. Um, yeah, and again, you can see the acute marrow edema associated with this, the, the empty uh, glenoid area, and all the soft tissue uh, swelling and edema around mm -hmm. it. And here you can actually see that the supraspinatus tendon is still coming around. Yeah. Maybe it's partially torn. There's the lung head of the biceps going, going up, so uh, a, a lot of abnormality here. And then here you can just see the empty uh, glenoid fossa here and the displaced uh, humeral head. So that's an inferior displacement. It's one of the less common, not the least common displacement, but, but one of the more uncommon displacements. Uh, and notice that the location of the hill sacs injury is in a different location, as you would expect. This is a very superiorly located hill sacs impaction injury. And you have to be a little careful here because this is also a pretty common location where you get erosions with partial tears of the supraspinatus that we talked about before. But here you can see that is basically a superior hill sacs injury, and you've got an injury to, to the inferior glenoid and the uh, labrum in that location. Okay, a motorcycle accident. Here you can see an inferior dislocation on the plane films. And uh, let's see, in this particular case, uh, relocated, you can see some loose bodies. 
some strains of the uh, of the uh, cuff. And what is that? So, uh, uh, Yuri, what's what's the structure in red there? That that the red arrows. Are I, I think that's the middle glenohumeral ligament. Um, uh, actually. Uh, actually, it's, it's probably the inferior glenohumeral ligament, uh, the anterior band of the inferior glenohumeral ligament. Uh, but it extends kind of high, though. Uh, uh, you know, I actually, I'd like to see the rest of the images. I think that, you know, I, I apologize. I don't remember the details here. I, that certainly could be the middle glenohumeral ligament that's torn inferiorly here. Uh, it could could also could have it's a long head of the biceps is what I was thinking it was I oh. think that's most likely what it's going to be which is one of the structures that when they dislocate can make it difficult to relocate the shoulder which is one of the reasons we talked about early on uh, many years ago people thought MR and the acutely dislocated shoulder was indicated but it was indicated only in situations where you couldn't relocate the shoulder easily. Uh, we now see all kinds of, we all know all the other injuries that we can see right now, so almost all these patients will get MR. But in the really early days, the main justification was to try to look for things like the long head of the biceps tendon, which I'm pretty sure this is. Uh, and I probably wouldn't put it in here otherwise, though you'd really need to follow it on the, certainly the axial images would be helpful, but I'm pretty sure this is the long head of the biceps tendon, which is what John reckon, oh, thinks it is also. So uh, here's a here's a PD fat set. We can see an abnormal appearance to the to the inferior uh, labrum here. Uh, let's see, Sheila, why don't you take this case? What do you think here? Okay, so it looks like it's an irregular inferior aspect of the labrum. Um, I don't see any marrow edema on the labor view. Again, it looks like there's irregularity in the labrum, and it looks like a sharply marginated line. So I think that there might be a – oh, and then it looks like there's some cystic changes adjacent to the – Yeah, actually, okay, so I think tear. this is a different case. But, but here, oh. just like you said, you can see the inferior labral tear here. And then what is – there are two locations where paralabral cysts are very common. One is a posterior superior, uh, yeah, posterior superior labral tear. Those cysts, as we saw before, can dissect into the supraglenoid notch uh, and compress the nerves in that location. Another location where they're common are associated with inferior labral tears. And sometimes it's easier to see the paralabral cyst than it is to see the labral tear itself. It's just that inferior labral tears are not as common as posterior superior labral tears, certainly at least in our population of athletes. But uh, but but uh, if you have a straight inferior labral tear, it's fairly common to see associated paralabral cysts, which we're seeing right here. There's the tear, and there's the paralabral cyst. And on the Aber view, we can see the, the tear nicely there. Uh, and again, here's just a case where Imaging is not great. Hard to see the labrum itself, but we, we know there's an inferior labral tear there because of the typical uh, paralabral cyst associated with it. And occasionally these can become very large, and there are a number of reported cases where these cysts can, can become large enough to compress the, the axillary nerve. And then so whenever you see these, especially if there's any size to them, you've got to go back and then be sure and you look at the teres minor muscle uh, to make sure that it's not atrophied from uh, compression of the uh, axillary nerve. And then here's just an, in, this is actually an inferior flap tear of the labrum, dis, unstable displaced flap tear of the labrum. And from a little higher up, we can see the tear extending into the anterior labrum there. And this is just what the flap tear looks in cross section. Okay. Uh, See, Susie, what do you think of this case? There's marked irregularity along the, um, and almost not quite a V-shaped along the posterior aspect. Yeah, the, 
the um, humorous. And also, I think there's um, fluid in the, sorry, laterally, and there's fluid in the subacromial subdeltoid. And I think that's part of maybe the biceps tendon that's coming up and looking so irregular there. I'm not sure because I, I don't know how far back we are or else that supraspinatus, but I mean really far laterally back there. Yeah, is that still supraspinatus back there? Because it looks really... Oh, oh, sorry, that's the bicep. So there's a like tear, in, tear of the supraspinatus tendon then with this lateral... I'll give you that. I'm not quite concerned about that. Oh, and then coming over to the, um, the labrum, I think it's been ripped off and is going down inferiorly because it looks like there's some abnormal... Right, right there, right there, exactly. I thought that was um, a torn labrum that's being extruded, no? Oh, humeral avulsion of the GL ligament. Oh my goodness, okay. Never saw one of those. So, a Hagel lesion is where you have generally a dislocation of the shoulder where, and here's the inferior glenohumeral ligament, it comes around and it should attach to the humerus in this location, and it's been torn here. This one is chronic because you can see it's a, very, it's a very thickened capsule there, very abnormally thickened capsule. So this is really a chronic Hegel lesion. Uh, there are papers saying that MR can't very accurately determine the exact location of the tear here, whether it's off the uh, humeral or off the glenoid part. But uh, uh, in those kind of papers, it's, it's, it's unclear w which of the tools to look at it are accurate enough. I think we can typically tell where the tear is, uh, despite some of the papers in the literature. At least that's been my experience. But these are relatively uncommon. They're typically seen more in inferior dislocations, which are not the common type of dislocation. Uh, here uh, is, a, is another example where, where we see uh, abnormal inferior glenohumeral ligament and some fluid ex extravasating down after an injury. It's it's very atrophic in this one. The other one was hypertrophy. This one is is more atrophic. The capsular ligaments uh, vary so much that uh, sometimes you'll see them thicker than others. And, uh, and then again, they're thicker anteriorly and posteriorly, and not so much right in in the in the midline there. And then here is a. Uh, here's a lesion where you can see extravasation of fluid inferiorly here with with this contrast, and you can see a little perthes lesion there with the periosteal attachment intact. So here's a 19-year-old with hyperextension injury playing badminton, and again we can see the the inferior tear here of the capsular uh, attachments. Quite a badminton game. A lot of other injuries. And here you can actually see a very rare phenomenon, which is supposed to not ever occur, but this is a case where there was enough hemorrhage into the joint space and it wasn't diluted fast enough where they actually develop a clot that they took out. This is something that's not supposed to occur, and this is the only case I know of where we actually had a clot within a, a joint space. That's not supposed to be happening. So here's a 51-year-old male who had a shoulder dislocation during bicycling. Michael, what do you think of this case? Okay. Again, um, I see kind of curvilinear uh, thickening uh, inferior and axillary space there. Yeah, that's probably a thickened inferior glenohumeral ligament that could be torn or injured at least. And then we have a... Uh, a defect in the posterior lateral humeral head. Um, so this could be from maybe from a shoulder dislocation. So what would be the mechanism that would dislocate the um, Well, that's a that's a heel sac, so it would be an anterior shoulder dislocation. And the mechanism we talked about is a fall onto an outstretched hand. Well, this is not the location of a Hill Sachs injury, right? This is straight lateral. Hill Sachs is posteriorly. 
this is a case, so this has to have impacted somewhere. I guess it could be an avulsion injury, but we don't see it displaced. This looked like this impacted against another area, and we can see the intraglomerular hemoligament tore. So one of the types of dislocations you can get is, I forgot the Latin name of it, but basically you end up as a Statue of Liberty with the displacement of the humeral head and the, and the arm fixed overhead, in which case you can get an impaction of the greater tuberosity, and in, in that position you typically will tear the inferior capsule ligaments, which is probably what occurred here. Yeah, we just uh, well, <laughs> Some people will come in uh, with their arms straight out, right up, as if you were holding up uh, on the globe like Atlas does. Yeah, but this one's been reduced. And you can see a, a lot of other capsular and, uh, injuries and injuries in the muscles surrounding it, as well as the labrum. This and the knee. So a lot of a lot of abnormalities. And then here in the axial image, we can see more of a posterior capsular tear in this particular case. Again, it all depends upon the direction of where the, uh, uh, where, where, the where, where they occurred. So, and this is an avulsion. This is on the opposite side. This is the normal side, what it should look like. On the injured side, we can see, instead of the intraglenohumeral humeral ligament being torn off the humerus, this time it's torn off with the inferior labrum off of the uh, glenoid side. So this would be an inferior glenohumeral avulsion, or some people will call this a reverse Hegel because it's coming off the opposite side. And just another example of a, an inferior glenohumeral ligament avulsion from the glenoid side, uh, avulsing off the inferior labrum. And this is just a sagittal image showing the fluid collecting in there where the labrum should be. And, uh, and yeah. Here's another case where we have a dislocation impaction in this area, and here there's a avulsion of the uh, of the uh, infraglenohumeral ligament off the glenoid side, or a glenoid avulsion called the gaggle lesion. Here we can see extension of the tears. Up, uh, against the anterior, uh, into the anterior and posterior labrum, uh, superior to the injury. Okay, Yuri, what do you think of this case? So, 39 year old uh, underhand ball player with uh, right shoulder pain, worse and overhead motion following trauma during a match one year ago. Um, there's abnormal. Uh, 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 Bone, uh, bone density seen within the inferior glenoid uh, rim, uh, which is suspicious for uh, for an inferior uh, dislocation um, um, on uh, advanced imaging. Uh, uh, yeah. So, so this is another kind of avulsion of the uh, infraglenohumeral ligament from the uh, from the glenoid side to an infraglenohumeral ligament okay. yeah, with uh, you can see some of the other anatomy in this area okay. in this case there's Terry's minor atrophy suggesting that there was a uh, uh, injury to the uh, uh, axillary nerve in the past So, so this was, let's go back and see if we can, yeah, this was a bony avulsion right here that came off, and that's happened, and there's compression of the axillary nerve. This is a more chronic lesion. Okay. And then uh, the superior area is a, is a big topic, so why don't we stop here? And we'll finish this out uh, tomorrow and, and go through uh, superior uh, 
injuries, including the infamous slap uh, lesion. Any questions? No, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.